Climate change related sea level rise has already started and will continue for centuries. Local government has a role to play in adaptation, but it can't address sea level rise alone. There are some surprising opportunities for partnerships in funding and implementing adaptation. Hi, I'm Dave Murray. I'm the National President of the Canadian Water Resources Association, and we're an association of water resource professionals across Canada, about a thousand members, uh, very focused on all aspects of water and water management from floods to droughts. One area we do a lot of work in is in uh, flood hazard management, floodplain mapping, and helping to identify hazards uh, to protect the public. Once the future floodplain is known, it's important to identify what assets are at risk. The managers of those assets are likely partners to help plan for and fund adaptation. The effects of Superstorm Sandy may be typical of a coastal flood in a metropolitan area. Perhaps potential partners for adaptation weren't obvious before the storm. It affected transportation, industry, gas, electrical and other utilities, hospitals, as well as government and the private sector. By planning for adaptation together, these partners can minimize the cumulative costs and the consequences of future sea level rise. The Fraser Basin Council has been facilitating a coastal adaptation partnership in the British Columbia Lower Mainland. Partnerships work in more suburban and rural areas too. The effects of sea level rise are do not just show up on our coastlines. They also show up in our river systems. In Surrey, the models we've done have shown that sea level rise effects will show up 15 to 20 kilometers upstream on our rivers. This will have incredible impacts to the people who live up on those rivers and also will mean a change in how we protect those people from these river systems rising as well as the coastal communities. Inland flooding has already been serious in the Samanos area on Vancouver Island, in the communities of Duncan, North Cowichan, and Cowichan tribes. Both extreme river flows and coastal water levels will rise due to climate change. When these higher water levels back up water in the lower Cowichan and Coxala rivers, existing flood levels will get worse. A solution underway includes a broad partnership. Local land trusts and conservation organizations, with senior government help, have purchased low-lying farmland to avoid pressure for future subdivision and to provide a retreat that accommodates seasonal flooding but that sustains agriculture of the higher fringes during dry season. Lower areas are naturalizing back to wetlands. The seasonally flooded agriculture provides highly valuable habitat as well. To protect existing neighborhoods in the flood fringe, that have suffered from repeated flooding, a dike system is being raised and extended. With pump stations to remove rainwater from within the dike ring, the system and recreation facilities and the Trans-Canada Highway. More intense developments within the floodplain accommodate a dike breach by dry flood proofing, lifting the grade up to a flood construction level. Recent neighborhood planning updates the land use and infrastructure strategy to improve the urban design and livability of the overall community. Just like Cowichan tribes, other First Nation communities are often near tidewater or in estuaries where sea level rise will increase flood risk for their communities. The Sanaas Nation in Nanus Bay had lost about 13 meters of shoreline to erosion. They designed and installed beach nourishment using carefully sized gravel to protect their campground and community. Outside of communities, climate change and sea level rise will also increase risk for valued First Nations food and traditions. My name is Claude Barton. I come from the Niscot village of King Gorlith at the mouth of the Nass River. As a coastal community, we rely heavily on our natural resources that we take out of the river and the ocean, such as our salmon and our olecans. We harvest olecans in February and March, and it's a vital part of our culture and traditions and our diet. Not only do we use it for food, we also use it as medicine 
with the way things are changing today, I'm, I'm hoping that we do not lose this vital resource that we rely heavily on. In some cases, ulichin, salmon, and other species will need to move their spawning areas to avoid the reach of salt water or to find proper water temperature. As we plan sea level rise adaptation for communities and infrastructure, we also need to ensure that conditions are provided to allow other species to adapt at the same time. So what's going on? Climate change is changing the patterns in this area. The salmon are not coming up when they should be coming up, and they're not spawning in the areas that they should be spawning in, and creating a tremendous impact on the production of the salmon in the Skeena River. Climate change is expected to result in considerable changes to stream flow. Effects will differ from year to year and in different types of watersheds. While precipitation is projected to increase in the wet season and decrease in the dry season, on average, the main impacts on stream flow for most watersheds will likely result from changes to snowpack caused by warming. In general, we can expect larger fall and winter flows with greater risks of shoreline erosion and changes in sediment patterns. In winter, there will be an increased risk of landslides and debris flows on steep slopes or ice or debris jams on lower reaches of rivers. In spring, we can expect earlier and lower freshets. In summer, lower base flows and higher water temperature could change the behavior and success of salmon and other species. Sea level rise at the same time will back water up into estuaries, sometimes many kilometers up the coastal inlets. Transportation facilities often hug shorelines with no alternate route or space. Some sections of highway and rail may need to be raised to avoid sea level rise. Additional scour protection at bridges may be necessary, and many shoreline protections will need to be upgraded in environmentally sensitive ways. The membership of partnerships for sea level rise changes across the coast but the principle of working together for common good is universal. Sea level rise partners might also involve the insurance industry, who is now engaging with the federal government in Canada. So historically, uh, flood insurance for residential properties has not been in Canada, um, but recently uh, the insurance companies have been getting together with the federal government uh, to try and introduce residential flood insurance in Canada. Uh, that's starting in Alberta, um, and they're working together with the federal government that's looking at putting funding into floodplain mapping or more floodplain mapping to assess those risks. Sites which remain susceptible to flooding. With sea level rise, some coastal flooding areas will become uneconomic to protect, and retreat will be necessary. In Canada, there's an opportunity to partner with parks or environmental reserves to manage flood-prone areas for nature conservation and public enjoyment between flood events. Widened shoreline trail and greenway corridors could reserve space for future sea level rise adaptation by greenshores, dikes, or other raised shorelines. For financial and public interest reasons, governments around the world are likely to insist that at-risk new developments be avoided in floodplains. We know from a review of impacts in prior coastal floods that a wide variety of stakeholders have an interest in avoiding flooding consequences. By working proactively and in coordinated partnerships, climate change and sea level rise can become manageable.